Alright guys, it's Jernigan. They're talking about Luton and Blackburn, more spikes of coronavirus on the news. I'll show you the news now, if you can see here. They're talking about it here. Government, new two new areas of intervention where COVID-19 restrictions will be tightened. Blackburn drawing, drawing and Luton. So yeah, it looks like the coronavirus is not going. There's the woman talking about it here. measures in Luton and just to tell you uh, about a special podcast the COVID-19 pandemic has of course affected uh, the government have so discussed two men in the area where coronavirus restrictions will be tightened Blackburn again the Russian government says the president Vata Putin US president Donald Trump disguised arms control Iran. The UK must face the possibility that it will not agree on a deal on its future relationship with the EU by the end of the year. That was the message from the chief negotiator, David Frost, who said with less than six months to go until the end of the Brexit transition period, there are still considerable differences between the UK and the EU. And the EU's negotiator, Michel Barnier, says the UK is showing no willingness to break the deadlock. Sky's deputy political <laughs> editor Sam Coates reports. Are we going to leave the EU in January or what? Good afternoon. See you next week. Round five of the Brexit talks finally back face to face. The readout is all about how big ideological differences remain. Perhaps not a surprise four years after Britain voted to leave the EU. Sometimes body language tells you more about where things are heading than the headlines alone convey. The EU has always insisted that an economic partnership with the UK must include robust level playing field rules and an equitable agreement on fisheries. This means simply that by its current refusal to commit the condition of open and fair competition and to a balanced agreement on fishery, the UK makes a trade agreement at this point unlikely. But with decades of shared history, notable how both sides have decided now is not the time for bombast and threats. Can you just spell out what has changed since the last time you gave an update? Well, I think it's the it's the movement on the European courts where the EU has listened to us, and it is the, the issue of the structure of the future agreement where we've been trying to avoid complexity that are the main things that have moved. But nevertheless, big differences do remain, in particular on the familiar questions on the level playing field, so-called level playing field, and fisheries policy. As everyone should realise by now, readout of Brexit negotiations, like the one we had this morning over there, are always going to be pessimistic right up until the moment that we conclude a successful deal. So to find out what's going on, you have to look behind the headlines, and there the detail is quite interesting. You've got talks, which could have collapsed this month, actually being extended till October. And then you've got Britain, pretty hard-line chief negotiator, praising large bits of the negotiation that have taken place to date. And the biggest single area of disagreement is over how much help the British government will give British companies after Brexit. Well, there, it's not so much that Europe has rejected our plan, but we actually haven't submitted one at all. Both sides have a lot of cards left to play. Both sides thought likely to give more ground in early autumn. Neither side benefit from no deal. But is that recipe enough? Sam Coates, Sky News. Now then, the country may have gone into lockdown as one United Kingdom, but it's kind of out of it as four separate nations. First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, has set a more cautious pace, and her approval rating has risen, along with support for Scottish independence. But Boris Johnson claimed today that the Union is stronger than ever on his first visit north of the border since December's election. Sky's Gerard Tuttle reports. <laughs> Marked his first year in office, clutching crabs for the camera. 
in Scotland. His leadership was forged in the heat of Brexit. Both he and it have survived the pandemic. Now Boris Johnson is facing growing support for independence in Scotland, and he came to deliver a blunt message. You know, we had a referendum on, uh, on, on breaking up the union uh, a few years ago, it was about, I think only six years ago. That is not, uh, that is not a generation by any complication. And uh, I think what people really want to do is see our whole country coming back strongly together. In Selkirk, on the Scottish borders, they're only slowly coming out of lockdown. The Conservatives won this constituency from the SNP three years ago, and two-thirds of the votes in the independence referendum were to stay in the UK. In a busy butcher shop on the high street, this 27-year-old, who voted for independence in 2014, watched the Prime Minister's message and didn't like it. Once we had the first one, and that was it, I thought, right, well, that's, we can put it to bed now, sort of thing, but... You know, Nicola Sturgeon seems to be quite adamant that we should be an independent Scotland. So we want to see what she says first and see what she feels in a good pace. Meanwhile, for the customers, yeah, I seen that. Boris Johnson's message only reaffirmed their divide. I don't want the independence. I think we're better in the UK. Every country has its own choice to be able to make their own choice. And who is he? We have a the Prime Minister insisted his government pandemic response has shown the might of the Union. But who knows Nicola Sturgeon's SNP look likely to form a majority government in next year's elections and won't be surprised at her scathing response. It's not how I would be choosing to spend my time given what we are facing right now. Um, and you know, people can make up their own minds about these things, but about where they think the decisions that we're having to take right now are best taken. Where's, where's the conflicting messages for Scotland's voters about the union have changed little since 2014. Now, both sides argue the pandemic has strengthened their hands. Gerard Tubb, Sky News. Well, joining me now is the Scottish Conservative, Douglas Ross, who resigned from the government in May over Dominic Cummings' breach of coronavirus lockdown rules. Very good evening to you, Mr Ross. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Now, you've got to admit there's a head of steam building up for another independence referendum. Is Boris Johnson an asset in Scotland to try to head one off? I mean, he visited Murray today for the second time in just eight months, and he's been here far more regularly than Scotland's First Minister. So he was showing by getting out and about every nation and region of the United Kingdom uh, that certainly in Scotland we have two governments, and when they work together, they can be successful. And um, what we need to do is reiterate the message. TV send itself off again. <laughs> Stupid bloody thing. I hate it when it does that, it's very annoying. What do you think? I mean, he carefully chose where he visited, and of course, it's uh, the visit is viewed throughout the entirety of Scotland and indeed the UK. You've got to admit, on the polling, you must be able to look at it yourself. He's miles behind Nicola Sturgeon. He's not popular in Scotland. Well, you see, he, he picked his visits carefully. He did. He went to Orkney to announce a Highlands Growth Deal, which is the Scottish and the UK government looking at paying £100 million invest in local communities. That's our governments working together. Okay, the he came here to as well as visiting a local factory. He was also thanking our military at Kimmel's Barracks and Area of Austin Road for the outstanding work they've done. Again, helpful Scottish and UK government during the COVID crisis. And our military are a great asset here in Murray and across okay. Scotland and the UK. And it's a strong message for the United Kingdom that the military have a strong team here in Scotland. Is Boris Johnson popular in Scotland? Well, all political leaders have uh, their uh, supporters and detractors, and you will interview some people who like Nicola Sturgeon and some people who don't. You'll interview people who like Boris Johnson and some who don't. That is the nature of politics. But what is important is that the Prime Minister said we had a once-in-a-generation referendum just six years ago. Okay. I think what people would expect the Scottish government to focus on the areas they are responsible for rather than more constitutional 
is in England's London. Is Boris Johnson as popular as Nicola Sturgeon in Scotland? The opinion polls suggest that Nicola Sturgeon has a higher approval rating than Boris Johnson, but normally a Scottish leader uh, has a higher approval rating than a UK government leader. Uh, you know, okay. the Prime Minister represents and leads the whole of the United Kingdom, and as I've said before, Scotland has two governments, and they can successfully work together to deliver for everyone. So, okay, we got there in the end. So, do you think it's been the handling of the coronavirus crisis that is making quite a big difference and we can compare and contrast can't we uh, an issue that you were involved in and uh, took uh, uh, some uh, affront at which of course is the issue of Dominic Cummings and his travellers during lockdown and Boris Johnson stood by him and has not sacked him. Nicola Sturgeon in a pretty similar situation got rid of the Scottish, Scottish CMO uh, pretty quickly after she as I say uh, broke those lockdown rules. Well, I think your original question was about how the two countries are dealing with the coronavirus. No, it I think it was about, no, it wasn't. It was about how the leaders dealt with some of their advisors who broke the lockdown rules. That's the question. They were very different. Well, the answer to that is yes, it was very different. But what hasn't been very different was the way the two countries have approached the coronavirus pandemic. And indeed, the Scottish and UK governments have been in almost lockstep during this entire pandemic. And you obviously, as I say, you thought that Boris Johnson should have sacked Dominic Cummings. It is damaging in terms of perception. You have one leader who appears to allow some, let's say, transgressions of the rules or some leeway on them. And Nicola Sturgeon has been assured and very straight with the Scottish people, telling them what they can and can't do. I'm not sure she's been as straight uh, with people as she would like to treat. For example, we had Spain on a list where you had to quarantine when you returned to Scotland uh, a number of days ago, as the cases of coronavirus... Get some iron brew from Scotland. This is in the can. Brew, Scotland, see? To the secret of seen in 1900. And just in terms of if there is, I mean, there's still a long way to go. Pretty isn't sure. there? If there is to be a second independence referendum, it's interesting to see, as you touched on it there, the Prime Minister is deploying heavily the economic argument, the support that the, the UK wide Treasury can deploy in places like Scotland for all those further schemes, not to support the business. We all, we all understand that. But didn't Boris Johnson and others find out that during the course of the EU referendum campaign that if emotion is involved, those economic arguments don't necessarily cut mustard? Well, I think what has been very interesting is Nicola Sturgeon herself has accepted that the support and opinion polls for independence has increased when the Scottish Government and the SNP have not been speaking about separation. So when they get back to their argument about how they want to rip the UK apart, and Scotland to go it alone. I think people will look closely at the economic arguments of Scotland as a nation or the four nations of the United Kingdom working together, as I said, 15 billion pounds of investment by the UK Treasury already during this pandemic. That's a pretty compelling case that has saved jobs, businesses and the important communities here in Malay and across Scotland. But what I'm also saying is they've got a blueprint uh, in part formed by Boris Johnson himself as you counter that argument with, with a slogan called Take back control. And taking back control for the SNP is to get 111 new powers from the UK government, making Scotland the uh, one of the most powerful devolved administrations anywhere in the world. And they want to give these powers straight back to unelected bureaucrats in the European Union. That's not a particularly positive message, I think, in Scotland. Great talking to you, Mr. Ross. Very much appreciated. Thank you very much indeed. Now then, Russia has carried out a missile test in space, firing a projectile from one of its satellites. And the United States Space Force, there is one, has described it as a space-based anti-satellite weapon, clearly therefore a hostile act and concerning. Our defense and security correspondent, Alistair Bunk, has the latest. There are some more sinister tensions. Well, guys and girls, hope you all enjoyed the video. Give it a like, give it a comment, share it with your friends, and we'll be back to doing the one later. Thank you for joining me. It's been a fun recent decades but there's very much a space race going on at the moment uh, russia india china 